All right, everybody, we are live. Welcome to the Mother Tongues Multilingual Open Mic. My name is Tatiana, and I'm going to start us off with a poem. To my son, I must tell you this life will not be easy for you. You born into a cradle of thorns, you will leave my womb already scarred by the fire set to burn you. You who resemble the warmth of the sunrise competing with the night sky, you carry the light conjured and consumed by the ancestors who dreamed of your well-being. And somehow you will only spark fear, hate, and rage from those who don't understand you, those who have never been blessed to witness such a gift as yourself. Those who will only see the beings they trapped in chains like livestock. Those who will only see the beings they locked in cages like beasts. Those who will only see the beings they envied because these beings were beautiful, indomitable, unstoppable, just like you. These are the same beings coursing through your blood that pump air through your lungs, shape the curve of your smile, hold the strength in your arms, force the speed in your legs, tailor the accent on your tongue, speak your name with pride, forbid you from ever saying, I have been colonized. No, my dear, because even though people will lash your back, mark your palms, and attempt to dump you into a neglected state of limbo where you can neither be child nor man, human nor savage, alive nor dead, remembered nor forgotten, as if those people can preach you don't belong on a land that was never theirs. You will claim your place bursting through concrete, breaking soil, and binding every soul you meet to the roots, twisting and blooming in your veins. You will claim your power. My son, you will fight and you will resist and you will know you are worth your weights in gold, in opal, in jade, in quartz and in every treasure this earth has birthed because my son, you are the child of gods. You, my son, will grow up knowing your black skin is an obsidian luxury others would kill for. You, my son, will grow up knowing your mind padded with unimprisoned curls is a freedom others could never imagine. You, my son, will grow up knowing your swollen heart is a prayer others will never hear the answer to. You, my son, will grow up knowing you are beautiful, indomitable, and unstoppable. You, my son, will remain uncolonized. All right, welcome, welcome, <laughs> welcome everybody to the Mother Tongues Multilingual Open Mic. Shout out to the American Poetry Museum for giving us this very generous virtual space that has allowed us to connect with not only from folks here in the DC area and the DMV, but nationally and even internationally. You know, DC is such a, a rich and vibrant and diverse area. It's such a diverse community. You know, when we're looking at the artistic world and, you know, the community in general. So that was really the purpose of this multilingual open mic so that we could highlight that diversity that exists within our DC community and within our artistic community as well. Um, so if you have had the chance to visit the American Poetry Museum here in the DC area, then you already know, you know, it's a very welcoming community space. It's really just about creating dialogue and, you know, putting the artwork first and having that conversation between the art and the artist and the community and creating those spaces together. And now in this virtual space, we can do that with this open mic, with these virtual readings that we've been doing. And, you know, you can also visit us in person, you know, shout out to Sammy Miranda, who's actually over at the American Poetry Mu Museum right now. He'll also be there tomorrow. And on Sunday, we have a new show coming up. So we've got some new artwork coming up by Zoe Vallarades. Uh, I hear she's very, very good. I have not had the pleasure of seeing her artwork yet, but you know, I'm excited for it. So I'll definitely be checking it out at some point. So if you're in the area and you feel comfortable, you know, you want to go out and get some fresh air, stop by the American Poetry Museum in DC, show us some love. You can also show us some love on Facebook and our social media. You being here right now with us tonight on Mother Tongues is showing us plenty of love. And let me tell you, I'm very excited 
for tonight's reading. I've got a, a lot of folks here who I've heard before and you know some voices that I haven't heard before. So I'm always looking forward to, to being in these communities in these spaces. I was talking to Sammy before this and he's like, you look tired, Miha. And I'm like, I am. <laughs> but you know, like being in these spaces, being with this community, hearing these voices, hearing this art and being able to share it as cheesy as it sounds, it re-energizes me. And you know, it gives me a breath of fresh air that that you don't get every day. So I'm very grateful for this space. I'm grateful for you all here. Um, pay attention to the comment section, please, because you know, we're all artists and we're really used to being in community with each other in person. So this virtual space is still new for us. So we like to hear people cheering. We like to hear people clapping. We like to hear the comments. We like that back and forth, that conversation. And we can't really have that here. But one way we can have that is through the comments. So, you know, show some love in the comments. If there's a line that really speaks to you, if there's an artist who really speaks to you, you know, let it be known in the comments section. If you have questions, put it in the comments section. You could just hit the like button, hit the love button, share it with your folks. Maybe you have somebody that you think would enjoy it. So go ahead and do that. You know, we want you to participate. This is as much your community as it is our community. So please do that. And I'll be dropping some links in the comments as well. So if you you want to hear more from our artists connect with them afterwards i'll be dropping those links in there everybody cool with that all right my artists are ready i hope everybody watching out there is ready too i'm gonna get out the way for now and i'm gonna give it up for our very first artist of the evening please give it up for liliana thank you so much tatiana Thank you for hosting and for having us here, having me here. I have to say I hadn't heard of the, the Poetry Museum and I think it's a fantastic idea. And I love this DC and visiting and I know they have museums for everything under the sun. So I'm very happy to hear there's this place and you know, I look forward to visiting someday when we can travel again. <laughs> So thank you everyone and I have one of the poems I'm going to read actually mentions DC so but I'm going to start with one from my uh, poetry collection that came out this year Codex of Love Bendita Ternura by Flower Song Press and there's other uh, Flower Song poets reading tonight so and this was written uh, you know, around February the 2nd in 2017, which is the Dia de la Candelaria. And it just passed, you know, and it's kind of like the end, end of the Christmas season, but in, in San Miguel de Allende, it, it, they also have like a, a festival of, of plants at a park and, and everywhere and people buy plants. So this is called the Candelaria Festival. Elegy for a Wayfarer. I walk along your paths lined with trees in the French style since Porfirio, Porfirio Diaz's time. Vendors offer plants for sale anywhere you go, from the humblest of cacti to medicinal herbs for diabetes, rheumatism, or arthritis. A man sells coconuts at 30 pesos a pop, machete in hand. Now my visits to Mexico fill me with longing. I miss my papi and his slow amble, his curiosity about everything pretty there is to see in the street, the way he strolled along and went out to meet the world head on. Today I pause to watch a man making pottery in the park, pumping away at the wheel with his foot, molding a jug with skilled hands, giving it form, creating something useful and beautiful out of a shapeless slump. Near the end of his life, my father would see things, pointing at a picture drawn in pencil on the wall and saying, that's you as kids. My indulgent, food-loving, chatty, jokester, pensive, intelligent dad. Walking on the cobblestones today, I recall your steps in this world. And my heart skipped a beat remembering you walking through the airports, almost blind, relying on the goodwill of other passengers, but with that yearning, that longing, that stubbornness to go on. 
Thank you. I have one in in Spanish. It's a, a bilingual collection. So, and I, I hear this is a multilingual reading. So I'll read one in Spanish dedicated to my son. It's called Círculos. Una imagen que ronda, que gira, que corre redonda en círculos infinitos que se persiguen, que corren y brincan en un círculo. Madre de rizos rubios e hijo de ensortijada cabellera se persiguen en un juego de corre y ve, corre y atrapa, corre y brinca. Corren en un círculo bajo un gran olmo que esparce generoso su sombra un día de primavera. Y ellos corren y brincan sobre el tumbling, ríen, se caen, se levantan, se persiguen en una rueda sin fin, perdidos en el juego del momento, trazando un círculo de luz, un lazo misterioso, madre e hijo. And I have one more, thank you. Uh, it's called En Vísperas de la Boda de Mi Sophie, on the eve of my Sophie's wedding. It won't be the first nor the last time a mother can't see her daughter on her wedding day. I won't be there physically in the flesh, breathing the same air to meet our in-laws the night before in Washington, D.C. Nor the next morning, as you get dressed in your lace white dress, the pearl earrings and pearl ring set your grandmother gifted you on her final, one of her final wishes for this day. That at least I was able to find in my drawers, save for nine years and send it to you, my love, mi niña Lindia, mi niña hermosa, Una mujer on her wedding day. I won't be there as you walk up to the grand staircase of the Cincinnati house on Embassy Row in DC. A COVID special, your dream Medici wedding, a historic house filled with Italian Renaissance art, a reflecting pool, vases, urns, and crystal, even a Buddha outside. But I will be there inside your heart as you look into Leland's eyes when he first sees you in your wedding dress. I will be there inside your heart as you pronounce your vows, looking into each other's eyes, swearing amor eterno, doors opening, paths forever joined. Lo tuyo es mío y lo mío es tuyo. Walking hand in hand, in this turbulent world, supported, acompañada. Two trees rising up to the sky, two trees giving each other shade and comfort, two trees standing on firm roots, two trees interlocking branches, leaves, shoots, mycelium, bugs, squirrels, owls, wrens, even the sun and the moon as they follow your days and light up your path as you hold hands, as you hold each other's hearts. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And I, I'll be having a presentation at the AWP conference uh, that's going to be virtual at the beginning of March. I think it's um, maybe March 6th on a Saturday about translation and translating Latin American women writers into Spanish. I'll be moderating that panel. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Liliana, you know, about your, your session that's coming up at AWP. And yes, please share the link. Please share the link and then I'll drop it in the comments so that I can, you know, more people can join. For those of you who yes. don't know about AWP, um, you know, it's probably the biggest writers conference that we have here in the US on an annual basis. Um, and it's writers of all different genres. So, you know, it, whether you're a poet, a memoir writer, a fiction writer or a combination, you know, a hybrid writer, or like, you know, if you're, if you're not quite sure what your genre is, you know, it's a really good space to learn 
connect, you know, build that community. Um, this year it is going to be virtual. So if you have the opportunity to go, I highly recommend it. Um, Liliana already said that she's going to be doing a session there. So that's one reason to go. Um, there's, there's a bunch of reasons to go. I'll actually be doing um, a session with the Latinx Writers Caucus. So if you're able to go, definitely go. Liliana, please shoot me the link so I could put it in the comment section. And Liliana, thank you so much for your work. You know, it's really beautiful. Do you do any like narrating or like voice work or anything like that? Uh, I have in the past, uh, you know, and I have a, a podcast too that I can plug in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Hablemos Escritoras podcast. And it's, a, it's fabulous because it, it focuses on, on uh, women writers of Latin America and Spain and just introducing people to new writers. And I do the segment of interviewing literary translators in English. Those interviews are in English. Some of the other ones are in Spanish. And I also do poetry book reviews of the, of the women who are in, within you know, that website in Spanish. So, and I also actually read um, The House of Mango Street in Spanish recorded it for random house uh, oh, wow. books. so oh, that man. was like my biggest you know voiceover job it was i was mad how like great. when i asked you that you're like i've done it in the past and then <laughs> house on mango street <laughs> well the translation of, of um, elena poniatos guys is the only book of sandra cisneros that i have not translated oh wow Wow. Well, congratulations on that. And I'm not surprised, you know, when you said podcast and all of that, I'm, I'm like, oh, well, there it is. And well, thank you. supporting women. <laughs> I writers. enjoy it. I enjoy you know, it. Sorry for the fellas that are in the group right now, but I mean, the women got to support the women. So. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely please keep up with Liliana's work. Um, Liliana is going to be sending me the link so that I'll shoot it in the comments for you all. Uh, she's on Facebook. What, el what else do you use, Liliana? Um, yeah, I have an author's page now on, on Facebook and, you know, Instagram sometimes. Um, yeah, mostly those two. I have Twitter, but I don't use it that much. <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Well, thank you so much, Lidiana. I, you thank know, you, Tatiana. Thank you for having you here. We hope to have you back as well. All right. Okay. okay. So we're going to transition into our next artist who was with us last time and is another part of the Flower Song family. So you all know him. I know him. And if you don't know him, you're about to know him. So please give it up for Matt Cerillo. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's good to, it's good to be here with the, some other Flower Song people and, and uh, some other folks as well. Um, so this is my book, uh, Mowing Leaves of Grass. Uh, it came out in 2019. Or very late 2019, so it really came out in 2020. It came out in uh, December of 2019, so it just made me, it came out at a time made me ill eligible for for <laughs> every competition. What basically happened, but uh, but but this is a uh, this is my book. Um, came out last year. Uh, I got another one coming out this year, also with Flower Song. We'll be sitting on the second floor, so I'm really excited about that. Um, but I'm gonna read some poems here. So if anyone's interested in this, um, you know, leave a comment in the, in the section below, and we can maybe I could. Uh, instruct you how to, how to get a copy. So, so I'm going to read, uh, I guess, uh, two, uh, both from here. All right. Sundown, Levittown, Fort Apache, Dirty Harry, John Wayne, Blackface, Minuteman, Moynihan, Gone with the Wind, Breaking Bad. Washington, Redskin, Confederate flag, the sword, the dollar, the cannon, the scholar, the cavalry, and the Ivy League history as written by lightning as the rising smoke of burning village. The ways and means of victors keep their victims. A front of thesis melts on the state of Virginia. Extraction, expansion, the weenie of the West, Lewis and Clark, Smith and West, and I'll circle the wagon with bloodshed and slave sweat, the crack of the whip, the law of three-fifths, the crown Republican con, the intended failures of reconstruction, the housing covenants that greeted great migrations is the same as the Mexicans in poor Mexico. So far from heaven and so close to Monroe Doctrine. To Davy Crockett. To prison industrial complex, a war on drugs is a war on our young. Bloody Christmas. For madness. 15 to life for four ounces, East Oakland, West Baltimore, South La Brea and Oliver North, Plymouth Rock, Jamestown, the Rio Grande, Stolen Lives, Stolen Land. And this next poem is called La Arena. It's from uh, this book as well. 
and uh, it's basically kind of uh, an ode to so many women I've known in my life, and also to the city I'm from, Los Angeles. So it's an LA poem. It's a Chicano poem. It's a you know. Here we go. Um, Los Angeles flew up, well as raised grandkids in Spanglish with a watchful eye with them of the Virgin Jesus. Make a village out of a duplex, raised Catholic, but the roots are indigenous. Seven generations of family extension all growing in one plot. Hand me downs that can share rules, rooms, and reflections. In la quech porque mi casa es tu casa and the city promises its family living. As palabra, sale candle. Burn some sage, pick your saints, set your altar, the sign of the cross. The sound of the conscience, prayers lift the four directions, that's culture, not contradiction. Folks in the back, they fight for living, 515, hail from the rowdy section of Dodger Stadium, but the hearts still burn with the fire from that Chavez ravine, and here is home of La Reina. At 54 cents on the dollar, America's most exploited worker. Neglected, disrespected, underrepresented, presumed incompetent, if she lives life as expected, she'll be labeled statistic. If she managed to outpace them, threaten, they will blame affirmative action, but either way, they will not see her. They will demand her labor, paid and unpaid, smiling, her eyes humble and not silent. Lay the river. Cities past, present, and future. The Queen of Angels. Invisible to those who float. Through canyons, lagoons, and cemeteries, whitewashing adobe through a series of fevered dreams connected by a bridge called her back to those who make demands. To the stories told to bury the past, the ones that serve to remind her that she works for them, that she is lucky to even have a job here in El Pueblo. Nuestra Señora El Reino, Sangre de Rio, por cinco dólares, they like to call it La La Land. Since the 80s, built the Pueblo. 1890s, break you out to Manabello, built one again, only beaten and shot. Went for no Mexicans, no dogs, no set of rules, written set of schools. We written out the history of the city. We found as we are priced out of the homes of our mothers. Here, more and more of Greater Los Angeles suddenly discovered this is a stroll of forebears. Un rapan, historia y terras, victoria, siempre. The struggle is real. La lucha sigue la arena de Los Angeles in the front lines of every fight, holding it down, holding the better half of the sky, fighting, education, fighting, for education, fighting, for tenants' rights, fighting, la migra, la hura, polisi, chingla, ice, fighting for dignity, hers and ours, all the damn. Time proud and brown and brown and brown in the hearts and hands, the backbone of these race fists. When we throw two fingers up, when we say Donald Trump, that's not identity politics, that is a cry of the proletariat at 54 cents on the dollar. She is the face of it. So when you see her, when you see her pushing some other mother's strollers locked behind cash, registers come out of third, fourth, fifth, shift to the oppressed, show some respect, bow your head, bend the knee, all hail arena, the once and future queen. More than grass. Flowers on press. Thank you so much. Matt, you never disappoint, for real. I'm wondering, you know, as you're reading, I'm wondering, do you like teach any workshops or facilitate any workshops? Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, um, I think I'm doing one tomorrow for Eastern Oregon. Either that or I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm speaking or doing a workshop, I'm not sure, I, I need to double check that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do, do workshops all the <laughs> <laughs> but it works all over the place. Uh, it's called, uh, you know, if anyone's watching that that uh, that books for, for universities or institutions, um, I do a, a workshop called the three act poem, where I show people how to um, how to kind of write like I write, which is like to look at at, at, at each thing is like an act. So like, Lorena, for instance, Act One is talking about you know Los Angeles full of abuelas who raise grandkids, and it ends with saying, "Here's home of Lorena," right? So that's the end of the first part. So it's kind of like the pride, and then I'll, then I introduce the pain, right? So at fifty four cents a dollar most exploited worker, here's the, the pain, here's the, here's the problems. Then the last act is the triumph, right? So the last, final act is the triumph. So it's like here in El Pueblo, Nuestra Señora de la Reina, right? it's called, you know, La La Land. In the 70s, we go to Pueblos, so then at the end, it's kind of like a roller coaster. It's going, it's going into the end, the third act, which is where all this climatic stuff happens. So I said ahead of time before I wrote this poem, knowing that in the beginning, it was gonna start this way, in the middle, it was gonna go this way, and the end was gonna end that way. And a lot of my poems are that way. So um, there's a whole structure I used to do that, in which on one side, we look at the topic, the details and the point, on the next side, act one, act two, act three. So we know that what happens at the beginning has to tend towards this, and what happens in the middle has to tend towards that, and what happens at the end has to tend towards this. So it goes on a journey of feel, as well as uh, the series of information that you get, they get delivered. So yeah, I do workshops. For sure. That's very interesting, you know, like the, your whole thought process throughout. And, you know, as you were reading, you know, and I was thinking about the last time you read with us too, and there, there's so much intensity and there's so much intention in the mm -hmm. way that you give us your poem and the way that you share a, with us your poetry. And I think there are so many writers who can benefit from 
just like 15 minutes with you, you know, just to, to kind of, you know, get that other, you know, a, a different perspective on how to be so intentional with your, not only just your pacing, but also your tone and, you know, the, the volume that you use as well. I, I think it's so brilliant the way that you share your poetry and, you know, if, if you're doing workshops like that are, that are open to the public, you know, please feel free to share because yeah. I'm definitely interested as well. Can I, can I share just a piece of little writing advice uh, that I have just in general for, for people? Sure, yeah. yeah. So for anyone watching right now who wants to really, you know, take their writing very seriously, the, the piece of advice that I have, you know, like, I don't, I don't, you don't want to write right now, but like, but like you asked me. So I've spoken, I've, I've done, done universities, I've done like a hundred universities, workshops across like wherever I've, I've done at University of Cambridge. The three-act poem I told is it's taught at Occidental and, and UCLA, I think. Um, so I have to check. But, um, but, uh, but, but the, what, the advice I always give, the, the most important advice, the simplest advice is that what you need to do is develop a style, turn that style into a discipline, and then turn that discipline into a standard of excellence that you hold yourself to every time. And this way, you will be the world's leading expert as to why you're great. And in that way, no one can ever discredit you. And you will never be hungry for validation. I mean, you can be validated and people can uplift you, but you'll never be hungry for it. You'll never need it. You know what I'm saying? You will know better than anyone, not only that you're good, but why you're good. You know, and why you are good. And the quality of your work can be a mystery to the audience, but it should never be a mystery to you. And you should know what you do and why and become a student of your own mind. Become a student of your own work and a student of your own mind. So that, that, that's, that, that's the biggest, the, the most the simplest you know, thing that to really start from that point and then, and then work your way. That's beautiful, Matt. That, and thank you for sharing that. That's absolutely beautiful. And I think what, at least what I've seen a lot in the writing community and the artistic community in general is there's a lot of imposter syndrome that goes on and there's a lot, a lot of self doubt. And, you know, sometimes when you're in certain parts of the community that validation becomes necessary you know you feel like it's necessary even though it's not necessary so i think having that constant reminder of you know i know why i'm great and i'm an expert at it and you know basically people need to catch up to it <laughs> you know I, I think that's a beautiful you said it a lot better than i did <laughs> but you know just just having that confidence in yourself and and owning the talent that you have so thank you thank you so much matt well, thank you again for the platform. I really appreciate it. Oh, of course, of course. Like, like I said to Liliana, you're welcome back whenever you want to come to. So just let me know. <laughs> All right, we're going to keep it moving. Next up, we're going to take us, so we've been in Texas, right? And we've been with the Flower Song fam. And now we're going to move over to Chicago. So yeah, so the American Poetry Museum is everywhere tonight. So we're going over to Chicago. Please welcome Oren to the virtual stage. Thanks for having me. Uh, usually my bylines appear as O period A period Fraser. Um, and since everyone is plugging, I'm gonna plug a publication called Expressions from Englewood. Uh, every, it seems like every large American city has a community or a neighborhood that's synonymous with a bad name, you know? And in Chicago, that community is Englewood. You know, Spike Lee came here and, and called it Chirac because of the gun violence. And everyone knows the story of Derrick Rose, the basketball player who was celebrated because he came out of this very gritty space. Uh, there's a gentleman, Corey Hall, who used to be the editor of the Hyde Park Citizen and teaches at Kennedy King College. And he got the idea as an Englewood resident to celebrate the life and vibrancy of this community that has been so beleaguered. I don't live in Englewood, but I contributed to uh, volume eight of Expressions from Englewood. And this is a poem called, When Jesus Spoke to Jake. <clears throat> when Jesus spoke to Jake, Jake threw his shoes away, strolled barefoot down the cottage grove to preach the word all day. The end is near. The end is here. Repent, repent and pray. I spoke to Christ this morning. He's coming any day. Then Jake began to sing psalms of love and praise to heal the sick and dying and rescue the unsaved. And when he heard the trumpets wailing in the wind, Jake knew the Lord, Lord Jesus, had come for all who sinned. So he turned to greet the chariot and make the case for grace. 
for all the fallen sinners and all the commonplace thieves and fiends and bums about to burn forever when Chicago tumbled down. Hey, stop, stop, screamed his savior. Stop, shoot. But this voice of prophecy lacked the ring of truth. So Jake spread his arms as his Lord once calmed the seas, rebuked the false prophet's calls to stop at once and freeze. Thus the book of Revelation found him on his knees, supplicant and breathless in the morning breeze, and headless too, but frozen like he was told to freeze. So that poem was to look at the intersection of mental illness and police violence and so on. And then uh, the second poem uh, was published in, we have a community publication called the Southside Reader, Southside Weekly, and they do an annual literary publication. I've been fortunate to be featured in all of the annual publications. And this poem is called Lula May, and like the previous poem, it sort of focuses on the marginalized, which is where I've spent my attention the last few years. So this is a poem called Lula May. They are fixing up the neighborhood without you, bell of my boulevard, Lula May. I hoped you would come again today wearing your favorite black shoe. Oh, you, mother to the street corner child who knew their names, cried for the nameless too. It is cold. Ice rain bullets the storefront sidewalk this somber April day, and the scent and sound of you are gunned away. Up ahead, a supine pigeon lay sorrowfully dead amid the swerving traffic of the busy street. The stoplight solemnly soldiers yellow to red. No Samaritan will lift the rigid bird, feather the alley garden with its shallow grave. Jackhammer shrapnel, the chilly air instead. A broken line of helmeted white men march upon the widowed and the weak, their pink lips hard, their legs long and lean. How they spit rough words, cold and mean. They want the conquered, cowed, command them not to speak. Their regiment bunkers the embattled land in the belligerent wind, indifferent to the saintly and the sinned. I look and swivel about for you, bag lady, I cannot live without. Your ten hats layered high, a colorful tall cake for a Cleopatra crown, leaning like the Tower of Pisa, and your mad wig queen look and madder parrot talk. Oh, these no good men and their sugary lies, pimps and their wandering eyes. The unlit streets, dead ends you have known, when your voice still sang so lovely a tune that Saturn turned and stared, disbelieving at the dumbstruck moon. You could do Broadway with your caravan of 20 shopping bags, the back and forth along the back streets, ferrying your world from way station to way station, two at a time in each hand. More than half your lifetime cruelly spent looking for home on a blue park bench under the Lake Park viaduct, sleeping besides the lake in the company of geese. I hear the youthful glee in the invading voices floating skywards to the talons of the light pole crows. They are rolling through the rubble now in the dilapidated southern lands, opening boutique pet stores, such food they have for dogs rescued from no-kill shelters. They are rolling through the rubble now. I'm sorry, organic dried buffalo tails to chew on. And you, my lovely Lula May, arthritic now and cold, hauling cans of expired Campbell's chicken soup to suck on in the dark and cold. So much we have, yet much more has gone away. I've lost, I've lost the haunting song 
O Sweet Symphony of You, Lulame. And that was written in celebration of the life of a marginalized person, the bag lady. And if I've got time, I would read a very personal poem, if I've got time. It's called, um, On Hearing the University of Chicago Medical Center Has Closed W3, Its Inpatient Psychiatric Ward. And this is a very personal poem that deals with my own long struggle with panic attacks and anxiety and agoraphobia. And uh, we are, I guess, at a place and point in time where with all that's going on, uh, we are addressing in a more uh, forthcoming way um, these issues and trying to uh, perhaps alleviate some of the stigmatism associated with various uh, psychiatric issues. <clears throat> so it begins with a little quote from Tom Wolfe, you can't go home again. So, is this how you felt, old man, when your childhood home burnt down? The witch spell songs you heard in the music of the cackling fire, when happy demons formed to rumba in the red and golden flames that once before a time were altars and armchairs of bygone youth, the brain making no sense of the spitting embers and the heavenward's black smoke spreading like outstretched arms of a courtly Transylvanian count above the summer lawns. I know how you felt, old man, watching your keepsakes soot the neighbor's apple trees, the people next door, the pavement in silent contemplation, glass giving way to heat, the rhythmic retreat of the rain-coated firemen and the hearty huffing of the latter weary engines. For I was caged in the four walls of my fantastic making homebound, housebound, bedbound, bound and chained from my old cold toilet seat to the far front door of my hovel with fetters no one could see. I wanted to be spirited away from the cold waters of Rikers Island to the colder cliffs of Alcatraz for the magic spell or the magic pill. Whatever the coven kept in the cauldron of the psych unit locked behind that forbidden plexiglass door. An elixir I'll cut or a sledgehammer to slug the neck irons of agoraphobia. I know how you felt, old man, when the firefighters hosed your kindergarten cutouts away. For I had choked on my vomit of last night's gin. My shit was blood shit from the vodka that ate my insides raw. Every mouthful a plea for the sonambulant haze of a sulfuric drunk to be indifferent. Asleep with both eyes wide open in a death stare for the long, long journey at sunset. Four blocks in the back seat of a four wheel coffin from my front door on University Avenue to the side agency room not more than two seconds outside, exiting the borrowed car. So I wouldn't float away up into the thin atmosphere, tethered by miles of bubble gum to the earth, then endlessly falling through space. I worried only about having no way back to the four walls I had on University Avenue from the four walls I needed on W3. If I sobered up, and there was nothing to blunt the fear. Gin, vodka, rum, nothing. To push away the poorest fright. You could stick one of your bony fingers right through my translucent soul, a tortoise without a shell. I know how you felt, old man, when your bungalows blackened the roof caved in from the heat. For I lived like Robinson Crusoe, marooned in W3, a leper's island of Fridays and madmen, away from the land I knew, hoping that the witch doctor and the head-hunting natives in white scrubs could conga away the black spell and set me free. 
I feel what you felt, old man, when the fire marshals boarded up your old house. For I walk unshackled up and down the sidewalk now, my brain making sense of the news casually given in conversation. W3 has closed. Some days I turn the corner or cross the street, walking aimlessly north like the freedmen before me trudging to Canada, fearful of the overseer, always looking backwards, wondering if I would ever need the witch doctor again. W3 has closed. I feel what you felt, old man, when the city condemned your gutted home. I look at your eyes like shallow graves on your plain brown face. I share your heavy thoughts that one day we too will vanish as though our arms and legs and heads were always an illusion. And this too, that I wish to crouch like a beaten chimp and howl hurt over the drought ravaged savannah forever. It wasn't just the sweet and tender shoots of our favorite bamboo that the loggers took, but the entire grove cruelly leveled so we could never climb again nor swing in the warm and heathen breeze. That's it. That's total. So that's kind of unusual because you've got someone grieving and mourning the closure of a psychiatric facility. So, yeah. Lauren, thank you so much for sharing that and for sharing such a personal part of yourself. And, you know, you mentioned that there is this, this stigma around mental health, you know, specifically if you think about like depression and anxiety de that are the most common. You know, I remember when I was growing up, these things weren't talked about. You know, it was, you know, you, you, that, you don't talk about that because that's something to be ashamed about. That means there's something wrong with you. And, you know, it's, it's really powerful that you share this poem today. Um, because I had an experience yesterday, I'm part of uh, an artist residency with a middle school. So it's a group of middle, middle school students, sixth, seventh and eighth graders that are part of the spoken word project. And it's so empowering and so beautiful to see these students talking so openly about their struggles with depression and anxiety and seeing the encouragement that they have for each other. And it does give me hope that, you know, that stigma is getting smaller and smaller and going away. And, you know, it's really because of people like you, Oren, who are brave enough and, and feel safe enough to talk about your own experiences. And it lets people know, hey, you're not alone in this. You, you know, I've gone through this. And, you know, what's happened with me when I share something so personal is that people who I never imagined could relate to what I'm going through, just come up and they're like, you know, thank you for sharing that. I went through this too, or, you know, that helped me get through this. So, you know, there is a lot of power in poetry and in these spaces. And I'm looking at the comments right now, and there's a lot of go love going on in the comments as well. There's a lot of community, a lot of support. So, so thank you so much for sharing that with us, Oren. We really appreciate, at least I really appreciate that. And, and okay. thanks for having me. I think that part of the issue with mental health and mental illness is that for the longest time, it has been associated with being dangerous. And we have got to get to a place where we understand that, you know, um, it's sort of like the 12 faces of E, that that's Hollywood. That's a caricature of the experience of what it means to suffer. Um, and it doesn't address the fact that we've got tens of millions of people in this country who are daily incapacitated with anxiety and depression. The numbers speak for themselves. I have a, an old classmate who lost a mother and a sister uh, to suicide. And there was an article in the New York Times that talked about the fact that for years, um, every demographic showed a spiraling of suicide rates but one. 
And that one group was educated, middle-class white women. But over the last 15 years, that group that had been stable forever is now outpacing every other group in terms of suicide. And again, when we talk about suicide, we're talking about the extremes of mental illness. And that typically, you know, most people uh, dealing with mental illness are walking wounded. They get up every day and go to work. They have children, they are wives, they are husbands, they are sons. They're on medication, they're in support groups, and they're doing their best to hang on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Oren. And, and thank you for raising that up. And, you know, before we move on to the next artist, I do want to invite everybody to take a couple of breaths with me. So can we just take a deep breath? Let's take one more together. And again, I want to thank you, Oren, and I want to thank everybody who is here on the Zoom and in the Facebook Live, you know, being part of this supportive, loving community where, you know, we are able to have these conversations and raise up these topics that are so very important and are affecting more people than we could ever imagine. So thank you. So we are going to transition into our next artist. Um, so we have seen this face here before plenty of times. Um, so I do want to uh, bring up to the virtual stage our dear Edward G joining us from Chile. Hello, hello everybody. Always a pleasure to be here. Sharing space. Uh, maybe a tough act to follow, but I'll uh, do what I can. I'm going to read four poems. The first one is called Miss and Reach. And it's, um, it's about teaching, I guess. Okay, miss and reach. I teach, I teach, I miss, I reach, I show, I tell, I pantomime, I do, we do, you do, you do what you can do. Without the metaphors, we are people in a room. Without the metaphors, we've got chairs and we've got time, time to miss and time to reach, reach what you can reach. Chuck the chair, set the time, half of it is being there in that I do, we do. If smoking was allowed, I'd have smoked in class by now. I have bombed in class, a course in full. I bomb slowly, the termites eating the floorboard slowly, bombing by plunging. I'm never sure if hell is hot or cold, but when the class is hot, nobody's repenting. But when it's cold, a drink in that hot hell doesn't sound like the worst thing. Teach, teach, miss, reach. I'm there in the stands, in the corner, in open space. Half of it is how you close that space. I'm there. For the prelude of that young civil war to rage within it takes years to fashion the factions but you must clash with yourself breadcrumbs for pigeons yourself whistle that noise through the gaps in the crumb that spongy crumb what will it absorb i want to say it's like chess but it's not like chess i don't know how the pieces move and i'm a piece too how do i move but i do move we move you move take away the words that people flaunt for why they teach those resume words sparkle magic words and i'm in the room we're in the room you're in the room maybe in Zoom. I want to say it's like dancing, but there's too many chairs. I want to say it's like gardening, but we're mostly inside. I want to say it's performance. Get up for it, sound check for it, like check for it, marker check for it. And the board and the floor and the faces you face, take it all away and I'll teach in space, in a trailer, underwater, if the signal's good. All right, so that's uh, kind of an ode to the job. <laughs> um, especially now in, uh, in uh, distance teaching, so remote as they call it now. All right, the second one is kind of a musical poem, kind of what I do sometimes. This one's called uh, Don't Play That Jazz. Don't play that jazz, no, know that jazz, that juke, that juice that you let loose. Hey man, the joint is hot, don't blow it out. Just blow into this noisy metal, just riff the stiff right off your skin. Dance to the wick, to your drumstick thin. Just heat the wax, cause the whiskey's loud and the shack is strong. And I'm bouncing around like a ping pong ball. I'm juking juice, I'm letting loose. Just shake the juice from your big caboose. I said no jazz, no, no, no jazz. No jazz, just juice. Juke the juice and let it loose. You lose the juice, dance to the bone, and you lose the juke that jukes the juice. You lose the juke that jukes the juice. You lose the juke that jukes the juice. All right, so that's kind of like the the old, you know, 1920s uh, juke joint jazz. 
And then the third one is called Flow 10, Cinder Block Dweller. And these are like poems that I write very quickly. And uh, it's kind of just all about movement. I try to write them in under 10 minutes. It's called Cinder Block Dweller. I know these times will be gone someday, but I don't care about that now. So many sugar packets inside me, all shaking like earthquakes. No, shoulders know what shoulders know, what hips know and taught them. Upper body knees, lower body shakes. I know I'll slow someday, but I don't care about that now. So fast the wriggle and the wiggle through the stones that pile me from below. I now make stones conduct my current and my current is what flows. Fleeting current of electrons fleeting always on the go. I know all this will be buried someday beneath a newer ground. Piles on piles, earth core thick, bricks on bricks on bricks on bricks. And like the ant that makes its dwelling in a cinder block and dances in its arching gaps. I don't care about that now. And right, the last one, I'm going to read it in Spanish. And uh, my dad uh, passed away, like, I don't know, 13 years ago. And he was a translator, among other things. And he wrote a dictionary about Cubanisms, right? So I'm, I'm originally from Cuba. He wrote this kind of like small volume on some, some Cuban expressions. So I took a couple of them and I wrote like a fake prologue to the book. So it's called Prologo a Diccionario Conciso. It's in Spanish. Prologo a Diccionario Conciso. Tajada de aire. Fritura de viento, la poesía del hambre cubana comenta el maestro en su libro de encuentros, su libro de dichos, lo que dice la gente, girando caderas por los malecones de las playas habaneras, ese nihilismo isleño camuflajeado en el doble sentido de quedar planchado a un tilín en tablitas, ese apenas, esa fuga, con ganas de irse, pero enamorado de Cuba. All right, those are my poems. Thank you for listening. Beautiful as always, Edward. <laughs> and you know, every time you do a music poem, mm. I want you to do poetry with Pepe playing the bass so bad. And we gotta, for, we gotta do this some, someday. Yeah, we have to, we absolutely have to. Folks watching from home, if you've been to the American Poetry Museum, if you're familiar with Sammy's work, then you know who Pepe is. He's like the most bomb bass player ever and you know the way that you know you do it on purpose when you're doing your your music poems where mm. you kind of mimic the sounds of the instruments with yeah, yeah, yeah. cadence and everything and i i just hear him so much and it's got to happen one day that's all i gotta say it's got to <laughs> happen one day <laughs> something something to shoot for yes like exactly it. exactly thank you thank you so much edward oh, it's always goodness. a pleasure having you here we missed you last month so yeah. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to make it a make it my usual my usual one month uh, appearance. No, I'm I'm just messing with you. You don't have to, but we did mess you. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I like being here. I like being here. It's a great spot, and I, I really really enjoyed the poem so far. So, thank you, thank you, and you know you're part of that community too. So we are going to bring it to our last artist of the evening, fellow DMV, not native, but resident on <laughs> call it i'm not a dmv native either but you know please welcome to the virtual stage fellow dmv resident fellow flower song mate we've got sarah closing us out all right thank you guys so um let's see if i can hold it together <laughs> or in your um poetry was so beautiful you know i said something in the comments i said we write from the wound so i think that's why um your piece really spoke to me because we have wounds like some are hidden and some are um, physical, but they're both just as prevalent in our lives. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, let's see. So the first thing I'm going to read is called Reclaiming the Narrative. I have a little quote from my younger sister. Sadness is just as beautiful as love. It is proof that love existed and nothing to be ashamed of. Part one. Let's see, my son's coming in the room to say hi. <laughs> hey, cutie. <laughs> Go hang out with Eddie. <laughs> it's okay, we love kids, Sarah. <laughs> he's, he's little. <laughs> handful. Okay. So, before I approach a masked woman, I wonder if she also keeps one, a list that reveals her private imperfections. I've got spider bands on my thighs, coarse hair frequently prone to frizzing unpredictable eruptions of the pain held within. 
I lost my father to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease when I was 28, thinking he'd stay around longer to nourish relationships with his kids, grandkids. I wept for days in front of my two-year-old, battled to get out of bed, eat. I walked and drove directionless. What is the role for having a body to scrutinize in the dark? Disorderly, disruptive, if we learn nothing. Let us air our list so they lose their power. Love a part of the self we could not reach before. Let us unravel and undo the strings to unearth the original shards of our distinctiveness until the being is morphed and their remnants are poetry. Part two. It comes from a painful place, finding the grace in the dark aftermath to say, I forgive you for leaving me too early. A broken spirit encased in a fragile frame, an uprooted orchid with no anchor to a tree or shrub. Mourning your death encompassed all my lifetime's worth of emptiness as I watched the stronghold of my childhood dreams and an ill man I love burn to the ground. Now that so much of my being has been destroyed, what should I do with these charred memories? Sweep through the ashes with faint hands? Find any piece of salvageable charcoal to hold between my fingertips? Press it against the page of a sketchbook. Tap, 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 tap. Attempt to draw a new world. And I have another piece. Um, this is called True Like Time. There was a bit of calm before the traffic, but the evening rush hour mirrored us, frantic, drunk, lusting, for high seas in the summer, wanting to be enormously wild like innocent children, clutching the language of untainted joy in our mouths, on our tiny tongues, small hands holding salt water, shimmering specks of light, when we could inhale, exhale, time. And youth was a typo, repeated too frequently, omitted too easily, Youth became a fragment, elusive like words we forgot to say or didn't repeat often enough. I love you, I love you, I love you. A run on sentence, then a full stop. Time and all lives are fragile. Building my first ofrenda for Dia de Muertos in 2020 to place my father's picture upon, put things into perspective. No matter how we try to suppress the notion of getting older, duller, Moments pour out of our eyeballs with a few drinks at family gatherings and we feel tricked by the minutes and we cannot stop time. So I'll just, um, I guess read the, my closing piece. It's called Waiting for Winter. Sliding door ajar, listening to December winds, pick up speed as the last yellowed leaves outside our window lose their grip and scantily clad branches form proscenium arches, botanical theaters, framing this gray show beyond the glass. As I step outside, the approaching season comes with icy breath, touching the neck, biting extremities. My fingers go numb, alternating between one hand in the pocket of my parka, one hand around the dog leash. My body halted by the unpredictable cold. I feel so much like an old tree which has been through landslides, the soil shaken at my roots, almost toppled over, my bark deliberately invaded by lichens and mosses. But still, I choose to grow upright, splash grounding water on my face, something rose-scented with murumuru to remind me of my siblings in California, resting a hand against a younger sister's cheek to produce perfect liquid lines of eyeliner on soft eyelids, or a troop of us frolicking through trails that lead to redwood fairy rings or the hollows of giant trees, staying up late in the kitchen to talk things over, to talk over each other, to laugh, be heard, seen. At least there is reminiscing to make our winter not so cold after all. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I think you did a great job reading. <laughs> so, you know, you've had nothing to worry about. I really, I really appreciate you, you bringing yourself to this space and, and your work to this space. I, I always find your work very tender and um, very soothing 
So, you know, I, I always appreciate hearing you read your work. So thank you for that. Now, I feel moved to read one more piece. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So, and then after this, we're done. I'm not going to keep you any longer. <laughs> Mandarins are prayers too. I scalp the orange in my palms, praying for serenity and wisdom. My thumb stained by dried golden blood crying from under the peel. A subtle spray bounces to perfume my face. Its aroma reminds me of a woman I'm not sure I've met before. It feels like incense dancing to ward off demons creeping at my window. I taste the flesh of the baby fruit, its juices flowing como riachuela around my tongue. It is sweet like ripe guayabas. It is cool like el campo at night. It is holy water made of a honey you will never know. I want to say thank you to all of our artists who joined us tonight. I want to say thank you to American Poetry Museum, to Sammy for giving us this space to have these conversations, have this dialogue, have, have you know, these pouring of emotions and, and not feel ashamed about it in any kind of way, just having that authenticity and that sincere, genuine connection. Um, and of course, of course, of course, I want to say thank you to everybody who's joining us on the Facebook Live. I see your comments. I see the love that you're sharing. You know, I, I always, always appreciate you being here with us. And and hopefully one day we'll be able to be back together in person and feel that energy in the room again. But, you know, for now, this virtual space has been able to join us in ways that I don't think we could have ever imagined before the pandemic. Um, I want to just say happy Black History Month, even though every day is Black History. Um, uh, happy Valentine's Day. So shout out to all of you all. Make sure you show yourselves some love and the people around you some love. Stay safe, stay warm for my folks who are here in the ice storm. I'm not gonna say that to Edward because he's enjoying summer in Chile. So, <laughs> so everybody, please take care of yourselves. Have a great weekend and I'll see you guys next month.